The Hudson River provided the first leg of our overland route to the Great Lakes. The river is named after Henry Hudson, an Englishman who was hired by the Dutch East India Company in 1609 to search for a shortcut to the Pacific. We passed under the wide span of the George Washington Bridge and the urban environment gave way surprisingly quickly to more rural surroundings. We passed an occasional marina and on the third day we reached Troy where we made our preparations for meeting the restrictions of the Erie and Oswego canals. After the federal lock on the Hudson we took the left fork into the Erie Canal, purchased a 10-day pass for $50 and commenced our climb through a series of locks referred to as the Flight of Five. The low bridges started right away. Every lock had weighted lines hanging down or tubes set into the walls, sometimes both, so there is no need to use your own lines. We were surprised to find ourselves sharing lock number four with a mother duck and her young family. The duck family were the first out of the gate. Some lock walls are very rough and we elected to use industrial strength garbage bags to protect our fancy fenders. They may not look too classy, but I can recommend them as being practical and cost effective. Some potholes are large enough to trap a fender as a boat rises and it is best to keep away from the walls if possible. A canal is essentially just a big ditch and there are guillotine gates at intervals along its length to control the water in various sections. We spent our first night on the Erie, tied up alongside the wall just above Lock 8. Lock number 17 had the highest lift of just over 40 feet. Here the water is being drained from the chamber so that we can enter. We pass beneath a guillotine style gate to enter its gloomy and dungeon like interior. Even here, another mother duck shepherded her brood through the turbulent waters. The following morning, tendrils of mist hovered over the placid water until burnt off by the warmth of the sun.
This was the lowest bridge along the entire route and the only one to have a height marker. With our air draft of 21 feet, we had barely 12 inches of clearance and a train passed over the bridge just moments after we had passed beneath it. At lock number 20, we reached our highest point at 420 feet above sea level and from here a lock lowered us down. Descending is much faster and easier than going up because there is less turbulence as the water drains out of the chamber. Included in the Erie Canal route is a crossing of Lake Oneida. We stopped at Mariner's Landing at Sylvan Beach the night before our crossing and for the first time saw large numbers of pleasure boats. The lake is 20 miles long and 3 miles wide. Waves as high as 6 feet can be generated in windy conditions, but for us the waters were calm. At times our progress was almost dreamlike, through still waters that reflected a mirror image of the forested banks. Finally, the last of 30 locks, this one with a different method of line handling, and we were free to escape into the vast expanse of Lake Ontario. It had taken us just 12 days to make the passage from New York. We now headed for the St. Lawrence Seaway, which opened in 1959 as a joint venture between the Canadian and US governments. Navigation markers were now jumbo-sized, catering as they did for large commercial shipping. And some are home to a single magnificent house or castle. This is Bolt Castle on Hart Island, and the ship passing in front of it is one of the purpose-built lakers, which can best be visualized by imagining a ship half the width and twice the length of a football field. We passed under the high-level Thousand Islands Bridge, which connects the U.S. state of New York to the Canadian province of Ontario. This area is known as the Thousand Islands, although the actual number is closer to 1800. Many are privately owned. The Canadian-controlled Iroquois Lock was the first of six we encountered along the St. Lawrence Seaway. This is a flood control lock with a change in level of less than two feet so we did not even need to tie up to the lock walls. After this first lock, we hoisted our faded Canadian courtesy flag and headed for the Chrysler Park Marina on the Canadian side of the border, where we officially entered Canada. The following day, we passed through the American-run Eisenhower and Snell locks, which are adjacent to each other. These two locks together lowered us 80 feet. We paid $60 for the two, with cash placed in a box tendered to us at the end of a long pole. The rapidly dropping water level revealed a battered wooden fender at the base of the lock gates. Its function became apparent as we watched the Laker enter the lock we had just vacated, with only inches to spare on either side. She had to use considerable power to force her way into the chamber in order to displace the water trapped ahead of her. We spent that night tied up in the Valleyfield Marina, where a charming French-Canadian couple 
drove us to the local market in their car. Everyone we met in French Canada was extremely helpful and friendly. The next day we followed the Canadian Beauharnois Canal, which had two vertical lift bridges carrying rail lines across the river. The lift sections are quite narrow and from the perspective of a long ship must seem like threading a needle, bearing in mind the strong currents. At the downstream end of the Beauharnois Canal are a pair of Canadian run locks with the same name. Here we had a short wait while the lake of Vosburg passed through the lock. Commercial traffic has priority over pleasure craft and we had been warned we might have to wait as long as four hours at each lock but the longest we had to wait was only ten minutes. We often had a lock to ourselves which was a sobering thought considering that each lock discharges 24 million gallons of water per transit. Our last lock was the Saint Lambert lock where the situation was complicated with two rail lines and a road crossing the lock area. Solid hardware is important for safe line handling with closed chocks and large cleats. After leaving the lock we had to make a U-turn around the tip of Ile Saint-Hélène and proceed upstream under Jacques Cartier Bridge. We now faced the full force of the mighty river for the first time and the current was running at seven knots. For Venture this presented no problem with her twin screws and ample power. We were allocated a good slip in the Marina Port d'Escal. Horse-drawn fiacs plodded up and down the crowded streets of the old town which is very French in character while buskers and street performers kept the crowds entertained. Colourful stalls lined the waterfront. Artists offered portraits and instant caricatures of passers-by. We spent two nights in Montreal before continuing our journey downriver. We were soon back on the grip of the fierce current. Along with the Lakers, we now began to see conventional freighters for the first time since leaving the Hudson. We stopped for the night at Trois Rivières so called because here the St. Lawrence River splits into three channels. The tidal range in Trois Rivières is three feet, but in Quebec, 67 miles downstream, it can reach as much as 18 feet. The speed of the current was very apparent from the rate at which the navigation markers appeared to be plowing through the water. Some of them well battered either by ice or being struck by passing traffic. Vessels making their way upstream had to fight their way against the current. The landscape on both banks was both rural and scenic, with church spires a prominent feature in almost every town. Two impressive bridges marked the approaches into Quebec and here the river and channel narrow with consequent increase in current. 
High bluffs on the port side, crowned by the ancient citadel, mark the location of the battle in 1759 between the British and the French, which changed the history of this part of Canada. The entrance to the old port of Quebec lies downstream of this point, just before a prominent line of massive grain silos. The current sweeping past the narrow entrance meant it had to be entered with resolve, and because of the tidal range, it was still necessary to pass through a lock to reach the inner basin. We waited in the outer basin along with eight other yachts. It did not seem possible that there would be room, but they packed us all in. Quebec was celebrating its 400th anniversary, and we stayed here for one week, moored in the old port in the heart of this delightful city. It was high tide when we left, and both lock gates were open.
Quebec City receded in our wake as we headed out into a turbulent St. Lawrence River. We had a seven knot current in our favor, but a 30 knot northeasterly wind resulted in predictably short, steep waves, and the wind picked up the spray and hurled it against the windshield. The water temperature dropped from 72 to 49 degrees when we encountered salt water for the first time since leaving the Hudson. Stopping places for a boat the size of Venture are few and far between along this stretch of the mighty river, but we were able to secure a berth in the snug Cap Leg La Marina, where overnight the wind dropped and we found ourselves in peaceful surroundings with only the sound of a nearby waterfall as a lullaby. Our next landmark was the distinctive Prince Shoal Lighthouse at the mouth of the Saguenay Fjord. The speed of the current was ferocious. In this area, water depths are up to 1,000 feet deep and the tidal range 20 feet. The mixing of fresh and salt water combined with conflicting currents produced sudden turbulence and powerful upwellings from great depths. Saguenay Fjord is huge and branches off the north shore of the St. Lawrence. Water depth is 900 feet deep just inside the entrance and in most areas remains as much as 300 feet right up to the shore, making anchoring almost impossible. We were lucky to find a berth in the small marina at Lens Saint Jean, where Venture towered over other boats. The following morning we headed downstream, out of the fjord, past the town of Tatoussac, and back into a squally St. Lawrence. We crossed the width of the river to the north shore of the Gaspésie Peninsula where the strong wind was driving the windmills which were a common feature of the landscape including a monster of radical egg beater design. Our route closely followed the coast of the peninsula. Our first stop was at Rimouski on August the 6th where the harbour master told us the temperature had been just above freezing two days earlier. We were now favoured with perfect weather in an area known for its ferocious storms and numerous shipwrecks. Our next stop was the town of Saint Anne de Desmonts. Whimsical works of art grace the land alongside the harbour. It was here we reached our maximum northing on this coast. Our furthest south had been two degrees below the equator in the Galapagos three months ago. Riviere au Renard, Fox River was our next port of call. It is very much dedicated to fishing with only a few berths for pleasure boats.
Like all ports along this exposed coast, the harbour had massive defences to protect it against the onslaught of the weather. Skeins of fog layered over the hills and gradually descended to the surface of the water. The town of Perse has twin landmarks of the Pierce Rock and nearby Ile Bonaventure, famous for the second largest but most accessible gannet colony in the North Atlantic, where 50,000 birds breed on the precipitous cliffs. We now left Quebec province and entered New Brunswick, home to the Acadians, who speak a different flavour of French. From there we crossed the Northumberland Strait to the English-speaking Prince Edward Island and the port of Summerside, where we found a snug berth right outside the yacht club. The following day, we passed under the eight-mile-long Confederation Bridge, which links Prince Edward Island with New Brunswick. Charlottetown is the capital of Prince Edward Island, and we were allocated a rather exposed berth at the Yacht Club. Quite by chance, our arrival coincided with the annual Gold Cup Parade. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police Pipe Band highlighted the island's Scottish heritage. Back out in the Northumberland Strait, I was just thinking that it would make a perfect day even better if we were to see some whales, when, right on cue, a pod of pilot whales appeared alongside Venture.
We spent that night in the peace of a small marina at Ballantyne's Cove. We set off bright and early the following morning. Inshore fishing fleets were taking advantage of the fine weather. We passed through a water control lock in the short canal between the mainland and Cape Breton Island at the heart of which lies Braddor Lake, which we accessed through St. Peter's Canal, completed in 1869. The lake is also connected to the sea through a narrow channel at the northeast corner. This keeps the salinity at about 60% that of seawater. We spent that night in the marina just around the corner in delightfully rural surroundings. Alexander Graham Bell made the town of Bedeck his home and his imposing residence is still owned by his descendants. He is best known for the invention of the telephone but his achievements encompassed a wide field and are far too numerous to describe here. There is an excellent museum dedicated to his inventions behind the trees to the left. After leaving Cape Breton Island we were back in the boisterous North Atlantic. Initially we had 20 knots of wind on the beam but the ride improved as the course adjustment moved the wind astern. Second only to Sydney, Australia, Halifax has the world's largest natural harbour. Its deep water remains ice-free in the winter despite its northerly latitude. We tied up at Queen's Wharf Marina in the heart of the city. Following the Titanic disaster in 1912, ships left here to search for and retrieve bodies. On a grey rainy day I visited the Fairview Lawn Cemetery where 121 of the victims are buried. After three days we headed back out to sea. There had been no improvement in the weather and we battled strong winds and head seas on our way to Lunenburg. After threading our way through bleak offshore islands, it came as something of a shock to round Battery Point and be suddenly confronted with the colourful waterfront of this historic town. One interesting vessel was the Barkentine Concordia. Just 18 months after this video was shot, she sank off the coast of Brazil after a knockdown. All 64 crew members were rescued after spending two harrowing days in life rafts.
We moored over the weekend alongside a remote dock we had to access through a hole in the fence. The wind direction was clearly displayed by a couple of interesting wind vanes. In common with every town we visited, there was a moving memorial with a chilling number of names to those who went to sea and failed to return. A testament, if any were needed, to the dangers of this treacherous coast. Our last stop in Nova Scotia was Shelburne, another historic town further to the south. Accompanied by a weak sun, the weather was now from aft and Venture was in her element and ran before it as if on rails, surfing through tumultuous seas and providing us with an exhilarating ride through the magnificent seascape. The utter calm of the harbour was in such contrast to the conditions outside, it was hard to believe that only a couple of miles separated the two. We had completed our 12,000 mile journey from Alaska to Nova Scotia and it remained only for us to continue down the coast of New England to New York to close the Down East Circle. Along the way, Venture had pushed aside ice flows in Alaska and crossed the equator. She had taken us 650 miles offshore to the Galapagos and squeezed through narrow freshwater canals in New York and Florida. She had sailed the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans and passed through both the Panama Canal and the St. Lawrence Seaway. She had taken all those conditions in her stride and come through with flying colors. <laughs> 